I've lived two lives, mate. I've been a, I've gone for a 10 year class A bender, come out on the backside of it, still with my teeth and all the conversation. Then I've started jujitsu. Like, how many people makes it to a jujitsu black belt? I think I had my first go on arrow when I was 14. Really? Yeah, and, and, so, they says don't smoke weed in your 15s or 16s because it fucks your brain up. I was like blasting class A's, do you know what I mean? So I'm sure. a couple of the older ones clocked on to that I'm just going down the wrong road, but I could fit through a council estate bathroom window. So now they're sending me through a window to open the doors and I'm doing fucking Augsburgers at 15 years old with the big boys. Oh, yeah. I followed a lad back to like over by to St. Paul's into the car park. I'm gone out there, I got a screwdriver and I said, like, give me the bag. And he's like, fuck off. <laughs> Which you would, wouldn't it? So I stabbed him in the leg. I'm taking the bag. He's holding onto the bag. I've dragged him to the floor, stamping on his fingers. And I, I've seen the cut of slashings and I've seen um, Art Ward. Mm. And the worst Art Ward I've seen was somebody filled up an old bucket with detergent in it and dashed that on a kid. And he had like green scabs because of the detergent and shit. But get her or not, like, she killed my dad. Do you know what I mean? Like, if there's ever a reason for revenge, this is it. And I said, like, so we had a KX, we had a, we had a KX a scrambler. And I said, well, we had um, like a little Tenerife baseball bat. And the plan, our plan, was to drive past and I was going to head off on the back of a scrambler. And I think the jujitsu at that moment has obviously guided me on the right path for the last 15 years. Welcome back to the Everyday Perspective podcast. Please like the video if you enjoy it and please subscribe to the channel. Today's guest is Brazilian Jiu Jitsu black belt, Jamie Horseman. Jamie, how are you, mate? I'm good, thank you. Thanks for having me. Welcome, mate. Thank you. Um, so, Jay, you obviously are originally from Bristol. Yeah. Um, people will probably learn that from your accent as yeah. we go. <laughs> <Pretty deep. laughs> yeah. You're now living sort of further into the Southwest and you locally you run a, a Jiu Jitsu club called Centaur yeah. Jiu Jitsu. Yeah. Um, when did you get your black belt? Um, 2019. Okay. 2019, I got my black belt. I went from white to black at Gracie Barra, Bristol. Brilliant. Bit courty, some people. Yeah. You know? <laughs> but when you're, it's a healthy court. Yeah. You know, we're not all trying to commit mass suicide. We're just trying to train. It's, it's just the, the, the no cross training and all that sort of stuff as I got further in. But I was like, back when I started, it was like, it was called a Creonte if you train, train somewhere else. That's Have you ever right. heard of that? Yeah, yeah, yeah of it's course. Like Portuguese for Judas, I believe. Yeah. So like, if you was training there and you're training there, he's a bit of a creon, who does he fight for him or not? And I had this sort of like blind loyalty to me coach. And I didn't want to be floating from gym to gym. So and I went white to black in this at the same place. And I to me that was like something I really, really wanted. Now not so much because i like I said, I'm really good at fun fundamentals because the the Gracie Bio curriculum, and especially when you're an instructor, you get the videos sent you and all this sort of stuff. And like I got it down in my head, like the GB1, GB2, GB3, but you never really went off off of that yeah. like and, there, and it was and they never did no in between techniques you know like escaping front headlock from turtle for instance right okay you didn't see a lot of like wrestling sit outs in and they'd call a Dela Hiva guard an outside hook guard right okay. like they couldn't give credit to the dude that mastered it and stuff <laughs> and at the time I was just blinded by it all because I just loved jujitsu and I'm still obsessed to this day and I loved all my time at Gracie Bar. it was like there's no bad not really we had our fallouts and whatnot yeah. but yeah, it was like blind loyalty what kept me at a club where I would have been a better grappler if I would have cross-trained. Yeah. But it wasn't a thing back then. You get this called a crunch. Yeah. 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 Good pronunciation there. Yeah. <laughs> Bristolian version of yeah. it. Crunchy. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and, and sort of from white belt to black belt, you competed a fair bit as well? I yeah. Think? I'm, I've done, I, I was 30 when I started. So like some people say, oh, master's category. But I, I believe that if you're a master and you're in the master's category, it's as hard for you in the master's category as it is for an adult in an adult category because effectively you're all the same like strength levels or whatever. Generally, master's got families going on and full-time work and whatnot. But I didn't do great at white belt or I didn't really compete a lot, but I think I got like four silvers. And then I won a submission-only competition at Gracie Bar Bath and I got promoted my blue belt there. And then after that, it was the blue belt is where I started to really I had this thing in my head like um, like I said this obsessive compulsive how I am it's like I was thinking one day I want to do this for a living and I want to, I want to have like a resume a CV where I've won this 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 and if somebody else opens a school there they're going to want to come to me because you've won everything and it, at the time that's what I thought was the, the thing to do but it really wasn't it's like I said I, I got so obsessed with it I kind of neglected my family I was going every OBJJF tournament in Europe. Like, I'd, luckily enough, I had sponsors after I won a couple of things and whatnot, but I was leaving my family at home and, and but we weren't going on family holidays and I was going a, abroad four or five times a year to do jujitsu. It just wasn't fair. 
Yeah. But my upset, and I just couldn't see it through my obsession. You just don't want to ask spite or being horrible or nothing. Like, my missus didn't say nothing about it. Like, she'd go, she'd I'd pay for them to go on holiday and that. And like, they might go somewhere and I might come and visit them after work if it is a caravan holiday. They've been, up, they've been abroad a couple of times, but I'd stay to train and go and compete. And it's like, I missed that on a bit, a nice chunk of family with that, really, mm. to be fair. But yeah, as a blue belt, I, I then I started like, I went to the, my first blue belt match was literally I got promoted a couple of weeks before I was going to the Euros as a, as a white belt and I changed it to blue and I got mashed. I got that, that, so yeah, my first fight was at the Euros in Portugal as a blue belt. It was a massive crowd, yeah. nervous and that. But I think what I took from that was I was never nervous again. Okay. It was like after every comp after that, like for the next 12 months where we went back to Portugal, it was tiny in comparison. There was no pressure. And then I went back 12 months later and I won the Euros at blue. And then I got promoted, and then I went back 12 months there, and I won the Euros as a purple on the first year. So, But then I, we didn't, I didn't get promoted then because the IBJJF rule is that you've got to be two years out of belt. I wouldn't have been able to compete in IBJJF competition right. again. for. I that's why that. Rick, okay. yeah, Ricky Bellingham was out back for a little while right. as well because he wouldn't have been able to compete either if he'd have got promoted a bit a bit faster. Because back then, nowadays, no one even listens to IBJJF rules. You've got black belts younger than what the IBJJF says you could be black yeah. belts. Like, it's... That, and that was the other thing. Being Gracie Baja, um, Carlos Gracie Jr., he's the, the main guy that runs yeah. Gracie Baja, but he's also the main guy that runs the IBJJF. So it, it was just like, that was the comps you did because mm. imagine if you had your own company and you had your other own company, you'd be giving the work to your own, because that's all it is. It's a profit-making company, the IBJJF. They just put on a good show. And uh, we were just all dialed in on IBJJF stuff because of the Gracie Bar connection, I think. Mm-hmm. I presume that's what it was. Yeah, I imagine so. It yeah. makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> From a business point of view, I, it makes sense. I missed it. I won, I, I won the, the European Nogi at Blue as well. Okay. Yeah, in Rome. And um, then I'd done the, I said I won it the year later in the Gi at Purple, and then I got silver in the Nogi, mm-hmm. which is a bit of a gutter because I was, I, was, like I, I was trying to build this resume up. And then Brown Belt, man, I struggled. I, um, I was Brown Belt for four years and I got silver. I can only get silver in the gi. But then now I'm a black belt. I feel like you've got forever now to win the euro. Like me master 10 or whatever. Like, <laughs> yeah. And you might one day get the black belt. Euro. Have you gone over and competed that black belt? Um, I did. The first year I got it and I got, um, I just got beat me. It was a, uh, I had this thing in my head like, where I was, I, was, I was really good in this one closed guard position. If I get my grip, I think I'm going to win. Like, I've got my grip. I knew the reactions. If he takes this, I'm going to arm bar him. If he tries breaking the grip, I'm going to... You know, like, I had this set. Yeah, you got your the, plan, eh? Yeah, the guy just did not react. But he had like four strokes on his black belt. He'd been a black belt longer than I'd been training. Mm-hmm. And he just didn't react one bit and just methodically smashed my guard and choked me out. <laughs> just like, <laughs> fuck, welcome to black belt, mate. Yeah. yeah. And that was... And how, how did you find the level difference? Um, something like that obviously he's been training for so long yeah I'm, I, I don't know I think if you're if you're losing half your fights you're at the right belt mm, generally because yeah. you know, if you're winning them all you get another one don't you so, and at the moment at black belt I think I'm I'm winning half my fights so I've, I'm kind of at the right level but it was that was a shock the, the, like, it was, and it was just that he didn't react he went overly aggressive what I find with the black belt is now is more of an exchange of techniques than it is of who's physically faster and stronger Whereas, like, when I'm at my at Pantheon, for instance, I'm rolling with a load of boot necks, I can be technically better than them, but some of them can just overpower me and fast move around me. More. Whereas, when I find an old guy like myself in the black belts, it's a slap of bum. And it's, it's obviously we're trying to be more athletic and stronger than the other guy, but it's mostly technique that we're doing. And I, I like, I know this is exact numbers. Like, I see, like, a white belt can make five mistakes and you have a dude ain't going to capitalize on it because you're both white belts. Four at blue, three at purple, two at brown. You fuck up once at black, the other dude's going to take your neck. Or, you know, like, right, it's yeah. not exactly those numbers, but the, 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 your opportunity is to mess up and get it back, get smaller and smaller as you go through the belts. So now I'm just a lot more thinking that I'm not, I'm not so rash. It's like purple belts. I'll be running out trying to do flying triangles. So just, regardless, I'll end, up, I'll end up in my guard. It's always just like a jumping guard ball. If I get to the triangle, I look sick. If I don't, I'm going to be in De La Hiva or whatever. Do you know what I mean? So, <laughs> but now I don't try none of that shit. It's like you spent that money, you traveled all that distance. Because that's I think that's the massive thing in competition is... um. You learn so much more from my competition. Like I've travelled. Like where did I go? I don't know. It was like a it was a plane ride and a hotel, and I was like it was nil nil, and I was probably going to get the referee's decision because I was really trying to pass and I was putting it on him and whatnot. But you look at the clock and you see the time, so I just tried to snatch a footlock, sat down, he stood up, two points for a sweep, and I just swept myself. And <laughs> you just paid all that money, but you'd I've never done that again since because that was a massive learn. Like, and I think 
you make about 100 mistakes a time in the gym and you just don't even know you made them because they don't mean nothing. There's no consequence to the mistake. But when you're out competing, you've paid your money, you've traveled, you've got hyped up, you've gone through the adrenaline rush and now you're area and then you mess up. It's like, shit. Like yesterday, I lost by one advantage. I was like, for fuck's sake. Do you know what I mean? One of, I'd rather get subbed. Like that's, you know, it's yeah. the fin. it's, you know, I don't know. But I'm still enjoying it and I'm loving it. It's, it's, I'm sure we're going to get to it, but this, this, my jujitsu, so the last 15 years of my life have been the most stable of my life due to jujitsu. And like I say, it's the best thing that happens to me. And I say, it's the worst thing that happens to me because I'm so obsessed with it. Sometimes it gets in the way, but it's never nothing bad. Like all the other stuff I got obsessed with in my life, I've had detrimental effects where this has only made it us better. And I got a daughter as well. So my, well, I got a daughter and two sons, but my daughter, like, because she was first and I was obsessed with jujitsu. I had her obsessed with jujitsu. And then so, <laughs> so from, she'd been training since she was, well, let's see, she's 16 now. I think eight. She's been done, yeah, it might be longer than that. She's done about nine years training. She's just got her juvenile blue belt and she's won shit loads. She've had the, we've had daddy daughter dates with Naga Dublin. Wow. Like both, yeah, both of us are sponsored. So we had the flights paid and all this stuff. We both won the belts. And it's a mate, how cool is that with your daughter? Yeah, both won amazing. the belts. She's walking around because at the time, Colin McGregor was the boy. And she's walking around with her fucking two belts going, the double champ, who's <laughs> what the fuck the double champ wants and all that. Like, you know? And it's, it's, like, it's, it's like, I've made some really, really good memories with our Frank. But on the flip side, my two boys, I kind of left them out because they weren't in the jujitsu gang and now I'm, we're, I'm trying to get it back so I make some loads of mistakes and fortunately enough I, I managed to just catch it before it could be really bad like my missus could have said loads of times you know what I'm fed up with you mate I'm fucking off you're just all you care about you don't give a shit about us it's, but it's not for me being horrible it's like I got a proper obsessive addictive personality yeah. and it's the fact that I found something was healthy addiction that you can't complete I think that's the key to it is Everything else, like, I was 24 when I got out of Nick last, and then I think I was 30 when I found Jiu-Jitsu. And in that six years in between, I must have went through, I don't know how many hobbies. I was doing Thai boxing, boxing, carp fishing. Like, all this stuff, caught a massive carp, couldn't be it, going to France and whatnot, and just spent, and, and in the end, like, the, my obsession can't allow me to, to concentrate on it anymore because you, you can't progress. Whereas what I found with Jiu-Jitsu is, after all these years, I still don't know that, hardly half of it. Not even half, not even, the, I, don't even I can't put a percentage to how much I know. So yeah. I don't know enough. Well, there's so many variables, isn't there? Yeah. It's just an infinite amount of variables. Yeah, so I feel like I found this now and this, this is going to keep me going and, and until uh, until I until I can't go no more, mm -hmm. but, you know? And I'm 46 now, but, and I'm finding it hard to get opponents. I don't know what the crack is with black belts, but half of them don't want to compete. And I understand about injuries and all that, but I don't think I've competed without an injury since blue belt. Mm. like you've got his niggles and knee injuries and like you just got if you want if you want to do it like if you let the injury dictate me you're never going to compete you're always going to have something wrong with you if you're training hard yeah and and, and I, I know there's like severities what, what do you think that is though with black belts do you feel it's um, I don't, because they run schools and then they don't want to yeah I don't want to say it's or? ego because you're supposed to have lost the ego now you're a black belt and all this but I, I don't want to lose in front of my students but I would rather lose and not turn up. Like we're, we're you're the boys from Council States as well. We're, it was all about taking part. Even if you're gonna lose when you went out there and fight that kid, mm -hmm. is if you don't go out there and fight him, then you're a muppet and everybody's gonna frag you off for the rest of your days, <laughs> right? But go out there and yeah, give him a dig it. and take your eye in, and then you can walk around with your head out eye. And I feel like not the same, but kind of the same. Like, how can I preach to my students like your game I get so much better if you compete? And they say, Well, don't you want to improve no more? Why aren't you competing? Mm. You know, so I just win, lose, or draw. Like I said, I think if you're losing half your fights at whatever belt you're at, you're probably at the right belt. There's no shame in losing. I think like there's nothing wrong with you. Get out there, man. What's wrong with you? It's like, especially for your students. My students, all my students, love for and do you know what? I reckon I get told ten times every comp by the young ones, fair play, mate. How old are you? And I'm just, I'm <laughs> old, mate. And they're like, oh, I'm, it's, they realize that they got another 30 years of training because they're only just 18 and he sees us still going. And they, and they, and hopefully they'll do it as well. But there's loads of reasons why people don't. Mm. But there's got to be a little bit of that as well. If it's loads of injuries, that's fair enough. But then I think there's also a load of people don't want to lose, mm. which is, and nobody wants to lose. But that's, unfortunately, everybody bar one bloke's losing. It's, that's the nature of the game. There's one guy going to win the comp, yeah. right? Aim for the podium. If you could hit the podium, then you're, you're or just aim for to get better than what you did the last one. But by not going, you're just not 
doing anything, are you? And you're not yeah. representing your team, your your students. You're not living by your your what you're telling them. Get out and compete, and then you ain't doing it yourself. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I love it. I absolutely love it. Yeah, I do, I do wonder with a with a black band. I know everybody's different, but. I think a lot of people obviously talk about, I mean, we had Bradley on recently. Yeah, he yeah. talked about sort of, as we all do, it's it's not the destination, it's the journey. Yeah. But I think the reality is we're all human. A lot of people will see that that black belt as the final destination. Yeah. yeah. And I think a lot of people will compete to facilitate achieving that. Yeah. And once they've achieved it, they're like, eh, don't yeah. need to put myself through that physical hardship, put myself out there yeah. anymore. So I don't know if it's maybe that. Yeah, and I can understand that like, some people just get nervous. Some people can't afford to travel around. Like, like me, I'm skinned a lot of the time due to travel. Like, I'm lucky enough that I got sponsored by my mate who's a scaffolding firm for this one, and he covered it. Like, But I can understand that like, people don't want the anxiety of it all, the stress of traveling. I drove like, after work on Friday, I drove five hours, got there, had a way, and then went to a hotel room to so dive. Then got there the next day, eight o'clock in the morning, didn't compete till like five o'clock at the night, got home last night, one o'clock in the morning. Like, it's torture, really. Who wants to go and spend a couple hundred quid to do that? Mm. And then all oh, you've got a shitty bronze. <laughs> I didn't even come back with a bit of fucking gold melt. Do you know what I mean? But I took some up from it, you know? Yeah. And, it's, and it's part of it. And the four, four boys what I took with me, all the white belts, all first comps, fucking loved it, mate. Mm. And they loved having me there. Do you yeah. know, like just helping them and whatnot. There's loads of kids are competing without a coach in the chair. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, you could see like someone should be shouting the time or like telling him that that bloke's digging for an underhook he's going to darsh it or whatever. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? It's, yeah, 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 or wizards. And, you know, it's no one says nothing. It's just, it's hard. Like, mm-hmm. your coach should be there. If you don't compete, right, and you don't fancy it, there's nothing stopping you travelling with your team at least. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like, why is it you don't want to compete or you don't want to coach your team? You mm-hmm. could still at least be there. I'm not saying that you could be there at everyone, but you could try to, couldn't you? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, I agree with that. And I think, I guess, thinking about my own personal perspective, because I've, I don't say, I, I don't like to say that I've done jujitsu for 15, 17 years. No, I've I haven't. seen on your podcast, I read it well, three I, times in 15 years, whatever, <laughs> <laughs> Kenny said. It's like fucking killed me. I know, yeah. <laughs> but, but I mean, probably up until I got my purple belt. So I got my purple belt in February 2015. Yeah. So what's that? Nearly nine years ago now, isn't it? Fuck. I think I got a double gold at the new key, yeah, yeah. at blue belt, and then got it like a week yeah. after. But since then, I changed careers. Um, Life yeah. gets in the way. It does, mate. And and that's why my training's been very sporadic since. Um, but what happened there is you chose to sort all your shit out in your life. Yeah. Because it takes priority. Yeah. Where me, being a Muppet, <laughs> I just didn't think like all these <laughs> like, I was just like burying my head in the sand with all these letters was telling me to do all this stuff. I'm going jujitsu, mate. And I was, I'm going to achieve this. And, I do, and I've neglected loads of important things in my life. Whereas I should have, I would have probably been not even a black belt yet. And I'd have had a good life all set out and running smooth. Yeah. Instead, I'm still juggling. But we're all all right. Everyone got what they want and whatnot. But I could have done it better like yourself. And... I've kind of rushed my way through. I was like a competitive black belt because I won it through winning competitions is how I got there. But I don't know if that, you get good at A game and whatnot. You don't, then you've got a Z game and you really, you should, when you're a black belt, you should have just a few A games. So that you should pretty much know if, and I'm probably lacking in positions where I want coaching. I was competitor and you know, it's like, it's hard to balance all to be a really good coach and a really good competitor. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I'm, I'm trying to be a better coach now. And I'm obviously I'm not the greatest competitor, but I think I've done a lot more competitive. Like I was more interested in competing than I was in coaching. Where I think I'd have learnt more jujitsu being a more of a coaching guy than a, a competitive guy. So I think I would have been better off taking more time into getting it slower and rushing through. Because I was old when I started, you don't want to, you know. Mm. But it sounds like you've done. You've got your life in order, and that's why you're still a purple belt for that amount of time. Yeah, yeah, maybe, and I don't regret any of that time away. Yeah, um, and it's one of these things that I say to a lot of people because I, I've all, I've always kept my hand in it. The longest period I had was during the pandemic yeah. when I didn't try to tour for two years, and then coming back after that was tough. Yeah, and I think actually Danny starting probably helped because that was you know, kind of a reason to start coming back yeah. with, with Danny and, and help him out and stuff. COVID messed up a lot. Though, yeah. 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 But I think from a competing perspective as well, it's one of these things that we talk about now and yeah. we're both thinking, should we compete? Because I competed a lot sort of as white belt and a blue belt. Yeah, yeah. Did a bit of MMA as well. But as a purple belt, I've only competed once and that was, I think, did the Bristol Open. It's in such a tough. 2017. Purple belt's tough as yeah, fuck. Yeah, I got, I got a silver, yeah, but, nice. it just, it, but it just nice. felt really fucking hard. Yeah, you're at the right belt. <laughs> it sounds like you're at the right belt. Yeah. And purple belt is like, it's like there's, it's almost seen as the first professional level, isn't it? Yeah. Right? And like the saying, purple belts must smash. Mm. It's like, it's just graph purple belt. I, I loved purple belt though. Yeah. Yeah. And I've, you know, it's, I don't know. I, I, I'm in that dilemma where I'm a bit like, 
because you talked about the anxiety of competing yeah. where I definitely feel uncomfortable. It, it was weird because MMA, I was, I was better because I saw that as a fight. Whereas I've always looked at jujitsu as a kind of therapy. Yeah. Where it's a peaceful yeah. place for me. It's not a fight really, is it? No. It's not. You're it's on not. a 40 mil soft mat. A geezer's just paid to save your ass if you say stop yeah. or tap. It's, the, it's yeah. not, is it? That's what it says. That I chose calming my boys down like on me. It's not, it's not, it's not like you're going to get your head punched in. You're all right. Do you yeah. know what I mean? But, but strangely, I found that, um, I found MMA easier to get into because I knew it was a fight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whereas because jiu-jitsu isn't. Yeah, it's hard say. to get aggressive in jiu-jitsu. Exactly. I'm so lazy sometimes. I've got to move what I'm doing. I let them get so far. Yeah. It's because it, it ain't that aggressive, is it? Yeah. <laughs> so that, I think that's my dilemma with competing. It's like, can I be asked? Because I, I just, I like enjoying jiu-jitsu. Whereas I find that the conflict side of it, I'm a bit like, what's going on guys? This episode is sponsored by Eden Clinic for Men, who specialize in men's health and male hormones. The details are on the screen now and in the description below. Head on over to their website and get yourself booked in for a blood test. Select EDP, which is the everyday perspective to get yourself a discount. In addition to male hormones such as testosterone, these tests also look at other health markers such as diabetes type 2, heart health, liver function and kidney function. The clinic is run by Dr. Angela Service, who featured on episode 13, where she spoke in length about the negative symptoms that men can experience if they're deficient in some of these hormones such as low mood, low libido, fatigue, and weight gain. So if either you, maybe one of your mates, your dad isn't feeling quite right, then it's worth having a look at some of these metrics and some of these markers to see how your health is on the inside. Even if you are feeling tip-top, it's worth having a look now because in the future that may change, and it gives you the ability to look back and have a benchmark. This is something that we feel really passionate about, guys, otherwise we literally wouldn't be telling you about it. Dr. Angela Service and her team can work wonders in regard to getting things corrected, and improving your life and your health. It isn't something worth taking a chance on, fellas. So get on over and get yourself booked in. Awesome, guys. Thanks for your time. Back to the episode. But now, now I'm a coach, though. I think the, the, the competition now has got took on a different importance to me. As in, like, not everybody in your club needs to compete, but you've got to have a couple to keep your school honest. Mm. Like, for instance, if no one competed, and then uh, you're beating us all up, we all think you're the Don, you're the... And then you go and compete and gets your ass handed to you. And we've all been looking up to you, and the national average just destroyed you. Like, mm. So, like, if I got a couple of blue belts was was doing all right, and then I got a white belt who's giving that blue belt a hard time, I can know that now he's getting closer to his blue belt. And this is where we was chatting about some promotions that I might give out a little bit earlier. We never had nobody to to judge them against because we never had no one compete and now we got a school full of competitors at like a couple at each belt and you can and it keeps your school honest you know it's like he's doing all right he's like he's getting on the podium at most comps he's not destroying everything the belt below him's giving him a hard time now and, and you can you can work your promotions better from things like that so if you do feel like it's too much anxiety or too much for you, as long as you've got a couple of other people in your school competing at your level you kind of can ride off the back of them to see what level you're at yeah. and whereas I never even thought about that before. It was all a selfish Jamie just wants to win a gold and have an eye like real. Mm. And, and I've also started to feel now it's not about winning at all. If you can get to the final, because that's like the best, and then lose the final, even though you don't want to lose the final, you've got some wins to take home and then you've got something to learn from. When you just win it, you got like a medal, an eye like real, and as you're the boy, you don't take nothing away from it, like, oh, I messed that up. Because you don't feel you messed up because you won. Yeah. Whereas if you get one loss, like, I got stuff... To, I could take from yesterday I just want active enough in position again being a bit lazy and that and every time I go I can take something away from it now but it's more now about having the right amount of people competing not everybody competing because it's not for everybody and it's not mandatory it will help your game but it's a bull week mm -hmm. if it is like yesterday there was people waiting what we was on there was people waiting way after me mm -hmm. and I've been waiting all fucking day so you know mm -hmm. there's a lot to take on board the competing yeah but again I do love it I can't start I just yeah it's one of those <laughs> things I've got addicted to now it's yeah. like the buzz it's, it's, I think I don't know I'm not educated right? this is another thing I went to an all boys school in Mary where they had the worst Ofsted report in the country and closed down like it's all boys it's like manic mate it was it was like I reckon it was like training for young offenders because when I got there <laughs> it was everybody from there it was in there remember? but but it's I feel like, you know, like we were saying about TRTRs, if they start using testosterone early in their lives and then their body stops producing testosterone. I think with my drug problems as a kid, I stopped producing like dopamine or feel good feelings. Like, I think I killed it off by taking so many drugs to produce it or whatever. Mm -hmm. I was like miserable. Mm -hmm. And now, when I, like, 
I know it's not, it sounds straight, but like, the adrenaline rush of going to the comp, like, or we're getting onto the max as I'm ready to go on, that buzz is when I'm alive. Or I, I got a KTM. If I'm on the bat wheel of that, flying, I'm 46, I'm having a midlife crisis, but I'm like blasting along on that bike, giving it some, I'm getting these these feelings that I would have got previously from drugs. Mm. So like the yeah. fight and the speed, it's kind of giving me, I think, I think in my head, like what normal people might get from doing something else. But I've kind yeah. of like, I don't know how true this is. I medically might be way off, but this the sort of shit it says to myself. It's like, why do I need the feel to need like, but even like if you don't have a fight, but say it kicks off a little bit, and I guess that you know your, your legs goes and you think you're really good, then you can or whatever. <laughs> and then when it all goes off, I'm like, whoo! Like, like I kind of enjoyed that. Not that I, not having the fight, getting the ready for the fight, and then it didn't even happen. It's glad it's good. It didn't happen, but to get that buzz on, like I'd say, like someone starts kicking off on a road rage instant, I start going, whoo! And then I, and I guess I get some up from it. And I swear it's why I fucked my brains up with drugs yeah. as a kid, because that's the flip side as well. Like. We're going to get back to what I suppose in a minute. Like I started taking drugs when I was, I think I had my first go on heroin when I was 14. Really? Yeah. And and so, they says don't smoke weed in your 15s or 16s because it fucks your brain up. I was like blasting class A's. Do you know what I mean? So I'm sure there was some damage done during that period when you're still growing and whatnot. And like, like I said, I'm not educated enough to, to know what, but what I've taken from it is now, I don't, I don't tend to get any buzz out of anything other than competing riding a bike or sex I suppose you know like the, all the manly things that I want to do and that's what I was, I, I was contemplating TRT and seeing if that would bring me back to where I should be or something like that I don't know but it's a strange one but I feel like that it's all come to this point like, you know it says all the decisions you made in your life like effectively brought you to where you are now yeah. it's like so and I'm lucky like I'm still here yeah. so but I do feel that there's been some damage done earlier and maybe the obsessions for these specific things might be because it's never ending, but it might also be because of the rushes it gets from mm. the adrenaline of it all. It seems to be all adrenaline fueled stuff that I likes to do. Yeah, and do you, do you get that same same kind of feeling when you see your competitors compete, or is it more when you're in there? Um, it makes yourself yeah, 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 yeah. I'm getting a buzz off then. Yeah. yeah, I am, I am, and that's pretty cool. And I got off of my kid when I Frank used to do it. I used to get a buzz off of her as well. Yeah, okay. and I used to feel dang when she lost like she did as well. It's weird, it's like proper in tune we was, mm. but um. Yeah, I don't know how, how true that is to, or what, but I that's kind of what I'm trying to make. probably something can it make. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I don't Definitely. know. Yeah, so you've mentioned your past a couple of times, mate, and obviously we're familiar with your story and it's it's remarkable where you, I guess, started life and where you are now. Yeah, I think that's what the, the why most people want to hear about is because... Yeah, yeah, man. When I was young and I got roped into all this, most people don't come out the other end of it, do exactly, they? At least yeah. with their faculties, like all the conversation t- teeth, they ain't got hepatitis. Mm-hmm. Like a lot of my friends in Bristol, they're walking around, they look like Simpsons, they're yellow, they got hepatitis, they got no teeth, they can't, and it's like, it's such a shame, it was really, really good people, and the drugs ruined them, and they're, and they're still good people, but to, to facil- facilitate the life they're living, they've got to do bad shit, and then, and that's just a vicious circle, isn't it? Yeah. But mine was a case of, growing up a really good family, like parents both worked in, um, never in trouble. I've got, I've got no excuses for ever being on drugs. You know, like some poor bastards, they're like, fam- they're on drugs as when they're born because their parents were taking it. None of that shit. Mine was just got into the wrong crowd at an early age. And like, first of all, we were like, I don't know, we'd nick scaffold clips off the building site and sell them to our mate's dad because he'd had a scaffolding for him, 25p a clip and four pound for a bone. And then we'd all go and buy like an eighth of pot and we'd go up into the empty flats in the squats, we call them. And we'd all do bongs all night in there on the park. And how old were you then? Like 14. Right. right. Yeah, so it's like 14 there. And then like one day, we just couldn't score no pot nowhere. And this is kind of how it first started that we all, all of us, about seven or eight of us at the time, all had our first try with heroin. And it was, there was a guy called, rest in peace, Zachary, and he's a, um, he died in a car crash after he got on drugs. So it's a shame. But yeah, he was on the bingo steps up on our estate. And uh, we was all sat there hanging around by the shops that we did. And, and um, we couldn't get no pot nowhere. And we asked Zach if he could come get us some pot. And he come back, because he was heroin addict, he come back with heroin. Which was, which was, yeah. And then anyway, he ended up like giving us lines of this heroin and then he obviously smoked the rest and give us a lip and we folded it up and we had it in the squat. Then next night we all met up, went up to the squat and we smoked this bit of heroin now like for like four days. What do you mean? Do you smoke heroin? Do you? Well, you ba- yeah, yeah, you can. Yeah, it's a dragon, mate. Yeah, so the way that works is you pour the, the powder onto foil 
and then you light it underneath and it turns into like melts into like a blob and then you chase the blob down the foil and the smoke comes off you suck it through a tube and then you're monged out you're effectively paying to be disabled you end up just sort of, and it's, mm. it's bad but once you're in it it's, it's like smoking a fag like when everyone started smoking a cigarette they all cough their guts up but they still end up smoking a fag like why would you if it was terrible yeah. and with heroin the first time we all tried it we all puked our ringers up it's, all, it's like everyone threw up but then we still went back to it the next day because after you got over that, the feeling was mental, like intensely nice, you know? And it, so we did that for like a week. And like in that week, we were still nicking scaffold clips. At fucking 14. Yeah, <laughs> I know. Fucking... How did you function with school and that? Well, that was the other thing. I was getting chucked out of school and shit like that. My mother, like, she, ch- my never, my mum was like a bit like me now. She was my mate, not my mum. Like she would, she was my mum, but she wouldn't tell me off. And I'll get chucked out of school, and that'd be the only time I'd go to school. I've been chucked out for two weeks, so I'll turn up at school looking through the windows on my mates for two weeks because I wasn't supposed to be there. Right. Do you know what I mean? Like just being a naughty boy, like. And um, yeah, so we started smoking this heroin, uh, and then we were still nicking the scaffolding stuff during the week, even though we didn't have to spend the money on pot. And then when Friday came around, like we had like a hundred quid, and we like found Zach, go and get some more of that. And then before we knew it, like um you start becoming sneaky. It's like, so whereas before, you, I'll meet you with a fiver, I mean, if I'm going to share it with him. And then like, after a couple of days of that, we're like, me and Ian anymore, it's us two. And then before you know it, you've got your own money and you're not meeting your friends and it just drives you, like, turns you into a sly little bastard. And then, yeah. and then, because uh, I've done, I'll, I'll do a disclaimer now, I've done some, I, I tell the truth, I don't lie and a lot of the stuff I did weren't very nice and I'm not proud of it at all. But I did like, bad things as, that once, I started getting into it more than a few of the other kids. A couple of the older ones clocked onto that I was going down the wrong road, but I could fit through a council estate bathroom window. So now they're sending me through a window to open the doors, and I'm doing fucking Iceburgers at 15 years old with the big boys. Really? Yeah, and like back then it was like Nikon VHS videos. I mean, that's what we were nicking. Mm-hmm. And uh, then I'm just, I'm with them boys, like I'm climbing through the window, opening the front door, waiting down the road. And then they're going to come out with the gear, take it off, sell it. And then we, before we knew it, it's, it's progressed to, I'm climbing through fucking windows that we're, the bigger, my mate, I'm not going to say his name, he, he could take the beading out of windows. And then the next thing, we're, we're doing occupied house dwelling burglaries where people are in bed. No fucking yeah, way. Yeah, mate. And I'm creeping around people's houses where they're fucking sleep upstairs. It's disgusting now. But back then, I didn't even think no, about it. I've missed a little bit, actually, right? Because I knew I was an heroin addict then. But before that, right, it was called browns or gear. Mm. No one ever said heroin. Not once. Like, I've watched Miami Vice. I'll have shit myself. I thought everyone was white powder you've seen on the telly, you know? And you would never go again. I wasn't completely thick. Mm. Like, if someone said, oh, you're doing heroin, I'd go, like, ugh. It was called Smack or Browns. And before I ever even knew it, it was, I found out I had a habit when I was up. I'm actually I'm missing a bit here. So what happened was my parents started clocking that. Someone's going, sorry, yeah. My parents started clocking that someone's going wrong with Jamie. He's not the same as he was. And, um, like I said, I had a good family. I could visit my nan, she'd give me a tenner. Visit my auntie, she'd give me a tenner. Brother, tenner. Ma, tenner. And I could get money. And if not, I'd be nicking stuff with the boys. Like, But she sort of like put a stop to the family giving me money. And said, look, like, I've heard Jamie's doing stuff. We've got to stop him getting the money. And then I was up filled with my, uh, on my estate. And I was like, yawning, tears running down my eyes and that. And I was like, what's the matter with you? And I said, I feel like shit. Oh, you're clucking, you're turking. I was like 15. What do you want about? He said, you need some smack, you need some heroin. I'm like, what do you want about? And then they took me off, gave me a little bit, and I felt great. And, I just, and that was the, the realization. Mm. That he was a that I, it, And yeah. I couldn't stop. I couldn't stop. I would. I would. I was considering robbing them. The guys that was giving me a bit, yeah. I was considering robbing their stuff off them because I I was feeling that bad. You know, once I realized what the situation was, yeah. then I, it was almost like someone told me like, right now you really need this. So I'd wait down the lane. And I'd, and there was young boys like like I said, I couldn't have robbed the bigger ones, mm. but there was the ones that was my age that was all trapped on it as well. I could rob them. So if I couldn't get nothing, then I was starting to rob me mates. And it's just like, fuck. what the fuck's going on with your life, you know? And it was just, and then it was, that's how it progressed. And then, like I said, I met my mate who started sending me through the windows then. Then he started taking the glass, like sending me was to occupied iceberg. It's it bad. And then I got caught. And um, I think I was just past 16, because I spent, yeah, yeah. Well, I got 21 months anyway. I got 21 months in younger. So you got caught by the police, but did you ever get caught by people that was in the house asleep? Did you have any sort of... We've had a couple of... Yeah, yeah. people woke up and we've had to run out the house. And like like I said, my mate, like, I know they said, like, I'm going to say he was on the ball, but in the wrong side of the law, he was on on the ball. Like, we'd go into the house and he'd put the latch on the door. So if they weren't home, then we'd be like trying to open their front door while we're in there fucking robbing our gear and then we'd run out the back or whatever. And yeah... 
uh, what happened was when I actually got caught, it was fucking crazy. So this, this just shows like, what a mental place your head is. I had the contents of two houses in a stolen car outside and I was nicked attempting the third one. It's like, what am I doing? And I was smoking crack in the car. Yeah, so I was in between, I've done that house, done that house, and now I'm going to do this one. And I'm sat in the car smoking crack on a can, and a fucking police pulls up next to me, mate. And I'm nerved with the con. Like, what the fuck was I even, what planet was I on? Do you know yeah. what I mean? I was, like I said, I was probably 16 and a half years old. Mm. And I was just like, way too young to be in the situation I'm in. And, the, and I could have probably had better guidance, but it was all so secretive. Like the one per there was one kid that was on drugs and he went and told my family I was on drugs because he didn't want to see me end up like him. Yeah. And then I had to put on this front in front of my brother. I said, he said, well, let's go see him then. And I beat him up going, what are you telling my family that you're lying? You know? And it was just me being a lawyer, beating the only person that actually tried to help me the whole fucking time. And at the time I didn't care, but now I look back on it, I think, fuck me, Nicky Davis. He, and I have a shame he's back on it now, but he literally, tried to stop me going down that route. Yeah. The only person that actually told me brother really? and family, yeah. And I had to- And you beat him up. I had to play the role. I had to really pretend, what's he saying? What's he saying? it? You know? And I didn't want to, but I did. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's like, but that was the, where my life was going. So then, yeah, I was locked up. Um, I was in, yeah, I'm close young offenders for, I don't know, about 10 months, I reckon. And then they sent me to um, the park in um, Wells. Uh, yeah. That's a privately run jail by Group Four Security. Yeah. I was like, I know I don't make much difference, but I do when I was in Gloucester, you got itchy green blankets and all that. You get sort of had curtains, quilts, the food coming fucking silver cartons, like it was from the Chinese because they had it all brought in. It was like, it was a different league, like, you know? Yeah. But yeah, so anyway, it gets out, gets out of jail, but never had no intentions of staying clean, taking it whenever I could in there, getting really? in debts and fights and jail. Okay. Yeah, that was like my learning curve. Like I learned you can't, maintain a class A drug habit in prison mm -hmm. unless you want to fight every day of your life and move around wings dodging people who's going to kill you <laughs> you know and I and I, I I tried to maintain that habit as best I could and I couldn't and then I, I, but when I got out it was like my first port of call was to go and buy some smack and then it was like before I knew it like all your family's glad to have you back again you're getting some money give you again within a, a couple of weeks you're back you're outcast again Robin mm -hmm and whatnot. I've done things like, I nicked my dad's BMW off the drive because my mate was living in a bed sit and they had a new combi boiler built, uh, put in. So we went to his bed sit, all the kitchen door shut while he's ripping the boiler off the wall and they're all kicking off in the house because we're taking their boiler. And then I put the, the boiler in my dad's car and ran out of petrol halfway home. And then I go and tell my dad that his beamers in Totterdown with a boiler in the boot. Well, no, I didn't tell him about the boot. And then he brought the car home. I've had to do his boot lock to take my boiler out his the back, you know, like scummiest things I did, like Rob from his wallet. I, and because he was my stepdad, I'd just, because you've got really good at self-justification when you're on drugs, you go across the dual carriageway there, it's all right to rob them because it's not your estate. But no, they're just people who work really hard to get off the estate. Yeah. And and that, But in my warped way of thinking, that, that they're the ones you've got to rob then. You know, like, and you're really good at self-justification shit that you shouldn't be doing. And so like, I robbed my stepdad because he's not my dad, but I wouldn't rob my ma. But that's their their. But he probably done just as much as you yeah, wanted for you. Yeah, you know I mean? he done more. He's like, yeah, and 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 they were partners, so it was their money. It, but in my head, that's how you can justify it without feeling like a total shit bag all your life, because that's what you are. Yeah. But you find ways to justify these be behaviors that you're doing, and then in the end, they got fed up. You get kicked out, and then my auntie's. I had a really, I got a really good auntie, right? And I, I get kicked out by my mum. My auntie come pick me up, and then my mum and my auntie are fall out because she said. How's he going to learn if you're going to just let him come straight out there with you? And she said, well, I can't see him on the street. And then the family's arguing because of me. And it's it just got knock-on effect after knock-on effect, you know? Mum stopped visiting me in jails. Auntie visited me every jail, sent me money at every jail, you know? How many times did you go in and out of jail? Well, um, actual convicted sentences, not that many. I've got like 21 months, 12 months, 11 months, 9 months, 6 months, 4 months. Like... But remand. Time. You say not. That, you, yeah. you said that not a lot. Yeah. No, no, not compared to some of my mates. So they'd be getting really? five years out for three yeah. weeks, five years. Oh, really? Yeah. Like, it's Whereas I was out. like doing smaller pay. Like once I got nicked for doing that, the house burglaries, the judge said to me, "Next time he sees you, you're getting five years, mate." And so I just stopped doing them. Like, right. And and I think what made me is like like have a word, my mum and all that. They had a word with me like, "What are you doing, James? 
like you know and I got actually and, and I'd like to say it's because of the moral value of all but I'll be lying it was because then I didn't run five years so I started doing commercial burglaries mm-hmm. and so I robbed petrol stations warehouses and shit like that because it's not the same charge and I'm not going to get five years you know I get 12 months and stuff like that but um, it was mostly remand time because what happens is you get bailed you don't turn up for bail and the next time you get snake, they don't give you bail because you fail to appear all the time so it, I'd always fail to appear so whenever I got arrested they just send me the young offenders until court next so I'd end up getting out a lot of times but I'd have served four months five months on remand yeah so it's like don't, I'm, by, by no means I was nowhere near the worst on my estate I was like it, like there's so many worse than me much much worse Like, but I was like the, the lower end of the scumbags if you could be you know so it's always just all petty stuff, like more like burglaries and yeah, rather than, than yeah. hurting people. Yeah, yeah. I want. Yeah, I've done a couple of street robberies and that, but it'd be generally mostly on other people buying drugs. Yeah. You can't really crash you up. But um, I did one with, um, which I know I'm not proud of, but it's uh, again, it's the sort of shit we did. I followed a kid back from you know JJB Sports, the mm-hmm. shop. I followed a lad back to like over by to St Paul's into the car park. I've gone out there. I got a screwdriver and I said, like, give me the bag. And he's like, fuck off. <laughs> which you would when it? So I stabbed him in the leg I'm taking the bag he's holding onto the bag I've dragged him to the floor stamping on his fingers and runs away with the bag there's a fucking a girl's pair of Reebok classics and a fucking pair of tracksuit bombs in there like, and I, could, I just stabbed the kid like you know it's like it's, my brain was in a fucked up place and I and I'm not proud of none of it and I, I really if, if I could see that kid now I don't know what I'd say to him mm-hmm. like I never see I'll tell you how jujitsu relates to this as well I might be skipping times a little bit but Fuck me. I was, me and my mate, we were um, driving around in Austin Montego looking for something to steal because we're drunk, junkies, like. Robs a van. As we're robbing the van, he sees a man running across the road. So he runs back to the car. I wasn't driving, he was, but he jumped in the passenger. I jumped in the driver's side because I had to because he jumped in the passenger. As I'm in the car, like, the guy's leaning through the window and he's blasting my mate because him F.A. because he got big ears. <laughs> he's blasting <laughs> yeah. F.A.'s face in. I fucking spins off. I drags a guy right down the road out, hanging out the car window. As we do, we see someone else jumping a car across the road and now they're chasing us in the Sierra. That's how old it was, a Sierra. And uh, it's not until we're halfway down the road taking chase. You see that the guy's on a radio and we realised that it was just our luck. The old Bill was parked across the road and when we seen him change seats, it was because or see someone getting in the car, it was because the passenger was to always be pursuit trained and the other one wasn't. This is what we found out after the police station. So then I ended up getting chased and we're in Austin Montego. We got veterans or whatever it was, right up our asses. We ended up getting a helicopter, getting nicked. Um, I got nine months for dangerous driving and six months for the attempted theft or something like that. But then, like a couple of years later, I'm a blue, or a few years, lots of long later, I'm a blue belt. And I got a message from Planet BJJ asking me if I want to be sponsored. So like you just say yeah straight away, and uh, then he messaged me saying, uh, um, "Did you ever live in? Uh, did you ever live? Uh, what did he ask me? He asked me a question. What related back to that time? And I was like, yeah, why? He said when I was a kid, I was watching Chelsea football on the telly with my dad, and he heard someone was robbing his van outside. He ran outside and he got dragged down the road in a car, and it was the fucking kid that sponsored me. Only sponsored me because he recognised my name from the court when I." dragged his dad down the road and I said to him mate I was a different person then I do apologise I got on the phone to his dad and he was like it all worked out and he sponsored me for a few he, he, the sponsorship ended pretty quick man. but but we, we spoke to each other I apologised to him but it's like that kid that was watching the telly with his dad all he knew of me is dragging his dad down the road and now he's gone to Jiu Jitsu years later mm-hmm. heard me name and it sort of all went back in like, but yeah it's mad, and, isn't it? and that was the first what time I spoke to a victim I managed to like say, I said mate I'm so sorry I was a, and, he, and he was alright about it to be fair and then I just went on this little mission where I was trying to make back <laughs> like get me karma right yeah. and because there was another one whereas my because like I said you, you you didn't care who you robbed back then like, even if they knew if I knew I was going to get caught later I'd still rob it now because he was that desperate and that's how bad it was like, you're never going to get hide in later I'm going to batter me that blue when he finds out I saw his drugs really? to his mate <laughs> do you know what I mean but, and, uh, and so what it was my mate's dad he opened up a, like a plant shop at Philwood Broadway at our estate and outside there this like table with all like racks of seeds like racks and racks and it must have been a pound of packing 
packet or something like that. But there must have been like 3,000 packets on that table. Me and my mate, my mate held the door shut. Me and my other mate ran down the road with the table and we ran off with our seeds, right? And uh, we sold them all to like, I oh, know, seeds, mate. But that's, <laughs> oh, no, sorry, I didn't mean to laugh. Uh, yeah, and we, sold, know like, what we probably fucking... sold the 3,000 pounds worth of seeds for 100 quid or something like that to another, or somebody who likes gardening. It was something ridiculous. But then after, like, the guy that owns like, our, um, our news agents, for instance, had like, not bulletproof glass, but it's all perspex off with a little hat so you get served through it because everyone's robbing in there. My mate got caught in there by him. No escape. He fucking battered him. And then he was after, then he caught the other one. He was like kind of after me. And I, I never caught up with him. And then years later on site, I'm working, walking into the canteen. He's fucking sat there. And I thought, but by now I'm a lot bigger. I'm not on drugs and whatnot. I could have filled him in rather than for, but I said to him that, Steve, I've got to be honest. I'm so sorry. And I apologize. And I want to apologize because I knew him. Like his, his missus is called Claire. Yeah. And it didn't matter that I knew him. It's just, I just, I just did You're it. still robbing. him. Yeah. And he said, Claire, I'll tell you to fuck right off me. Mm. I said, well, I can't believe it. He said, buy her a bottle of gin and a bottle of sun. She, you might have a chance. So that <laughs> night I went and I brought him in the next day and I put a sorry card. And I know I, I, I got, so many victims that I haven't been able to apologize to, mm. but the ones that I knew on my estate now, I've kind of made it back trying to get because I do regret everything. And like you do, laughs at some of the stuff because some of it is fucking is comedy gold. Like some of this crazy shit we got up to, you'd never believe it. But at the time, mate, my family was in bits and it's it's fucked for a long time because mm. of me, you know. Yeah, mate. It's um, yeah. As you're talking, it just reminds me of my upbringing because I was around people like you yeah. back then and so you've much. seen them walking around yeah, yeah. mate and um, it's funny because my other half she she's not from that sort of area but she she's a she's a medic and she actually works with a lot of drug addicts yeah and often she'll come back to me and say oh so and so's you know they won't give me obviously details but I've got this patient who's you know got liver disease and they want to transplant. We think they're still taking drugs, but they're saying they aren't. What would you think? And I'll ask a couple of questions. I'm like, yeah, they're definitely not. Yeah. That, mm. And it's it's because <laughs> I know that when people are, uh, are in that life and they're, they're on, you know, they're addicted. It's so hard to stop. It's unbelievable. I wanted to ask you at the start, because you mentioned there was some terminology confusion about, it sounded like you once didn't realize you were taking heroin. Yeah, well, it was called smacker gear yeah. or brands. Because cause I know with me growing up, I was around it literally, literally my whole childhood and I've got mates that yeah. have died or old mates that have died and I've seen mates go on it, just turn into like pond life and then yeah. come off it and it's repeat that cycle. Yeah, but I've seen it destroy lives. I've seen how it can rip through a community. Like you say, like one person gets on it and the effect on their family, yeah. the amount of petty crime that's generated as a result. Yeah. Um, so I've seen it over and over and as a kid growing up, because I was witness to that, I was always very, very wary of all the things I might have dabbled in. Yeah. Not um, to mess with that one. Yeah, I mean, I've been sat in houses with people injecting. I've stepped over people in stairwells that I've been with a needle, so I've been there. But because I'd seen that, that yeah. was enough to make that. That's one thing. That's what I didn't get. If right. I was, yeah, like well, I got nephews, two nephews. That, that's my auntie, well, that's what took me in all the time. They've yeah. seen me in the right states and they've never touched a drug. Yeah, that's the same I, as me. Yeah, literally. I, ne yeah. I, never got to, I never got to witness it. Unfortunately, I was the, the, the one who tried it. Yeah. Yeah, not the yeah. one who witnessed yeah. it. It's, um, yeah, and, and what didn't help me is, like I said, when I was 14, like even the drug dealers kind of had enough morals to not want to sell a 14 year old smack. Right. But, it was like, I was just saying, well, you know so-and-so served me. And then I like, oh, might as well have the money then. And what I was, I lived in the, a pad stay road and over the back of me was a guy called Ox. And I, I could literally run to my back wall, shout out to, to Ox, he'd bring a 10 bag to my, or a wrap it was back then, and we'd do an exchange over the back wall when my mum's not in. And I could be back in my bedroom before my mum come back from the shop, smoking heroin, and she thinks her boy's upstairs playing on the PlayStation. And that's loads of like, and there was times when like, that's a crazy story though, and I think of my son who's who's eleven, nearly twelve, and, never and he's like, yeah, you know what I mean. Still such a such a baby in my eyes, you yeah. know. He probably wouldn't like me here to say I, that, I, but I want and I want like a um, a mature fourteen year old, mm. you know. I want like I was like you know like, yeah. the early ones. I was a little, uh, but is um is like loads of different things went wrong. It was like, like that guy over the back should have just said fuck off and told me ma. You know what I mean? It's like he's trying to come here and get drugs or whatever, but instead it was a deal. And I could be back upstairs smoking it without her knowing. Yeah. And, and then our mum, when she did find out, and she, it was all a thing, the time she bought me a PlayStation and said, Jamie, we've got to do a stay in for two weeks. I've read it and this and that. She'd go out, I'll run off and sell the PlayStation. No come, way. Yeah, I'd come back like a couple of days later. And it just, 
love you, so they didn't care, you know? Yeah. And then the downside to all this, really, because my mother, she's loved, oh, she was so lovely, she really was. I got out when I was 24, like, on the last thing. I went, I got sent to Parkhurst doing a 12 month stretch. That's a story. And it's not like I got, I thought I was going to get bummed, mate. Like, the biggest scare. Who was getting bummed? I thought I was going to get bummed. Like, the biggest scare when you're going to jail, like, yeah. when, especially when I was 16 on that bus going to the young offenders, you just think you're going to get. Your ass, your ass raped, didn't it? You were all the shit on the yeah. telly and all that. Like, you're doing a scum yeah. and all those things. Yeah, yeah. But when I got there, like it was all locked up. You could hear them all chatting in their cells and you're walking through with your bed pack, like skinny little smack rat. Fucking ain't got a fight in you. Do you know what I mean? And uh, I was locked up in my cell. I remember I said I mentioned my mate F.A. Mm -hmm. I was in my cell and I heard someone shout out, F.A., F.A., how much is that house on Old Kent Road? So they were playing Monopoly in their cell. And Effie shouted about, fuck me, it's 50 quid. Right? <laughs> right. So I just like, oh, F.A., F.A. And he's who's out? I said, oh, where's man? He went, no way. Then my other mate, Ooper, shouted out, yeah, Soros, what are you doing in here for? And then my other mate, I just had a flood of relief. I thought, thank God. Like, you know? And then in the morning, they opened my door. And I tell you, it was like being in my year at school. It's no all way. my mates, because right? it's the local remand centre from my area, you know? And it's just, and after that, it was kind of like, when I was in school, once I realised the teacher couldn't really do nothing, he had no power over me. It was like, he was just say fuck off. Mm -hmm. And I was rude and I was horrible, but that's how it was. And then it was the same, same as when I was, I was in this young offender. It was like, I'll be getting up to stuff and the, the, the screw will be like, Whoa, and I'll say, what are you going to do? I'm in the worst place you could put me, mate. And, yeah. and, and once you've got that mentality, you're fucked. And that was my mentality at the time. And especially after that first stint and it was all my mates there. And then you, and then once you've been in it, and you comes out, you kind of knows who's in, who's out. You still send them letters on a post order when yeah. you can afford it and whatnot. And like, you when you when you get in it to us, right? Someone says that there and right, all the boys, and it's, it's it becomes like almost part of it's the risk. It's like you know that's what you're risking. Like, and, I, and then it starts becoming that's your your healthy camp now. So I have got six months, get fresh, get straight again. No intention to stop when I gets out, none at all. But this is like. It's probably saved me life this one because I'm nearly dead and that's the other thing I OD'd a couple of times I was going to ask about that yeah nothing yeah. Enough, like because obviously I, I went onto the needles as well people don't people don't want to admit none of these layers they like to tell a story but they don't like to put themselves how, how does that transition as, happen do you know what I mean where you're smoking it and then you think one day I'm going to whip out a needle generally what happens is you've got no money somebody else has got some and they are injecting so they say, oh, I'll give you some. Well, I'm not putting half of it on the foil. You could have, you could draw up some of this, and and that's how you end up. And then, like, and I'd like to say I never share the needle, but again, I'll be fucking lying, and I'm not here to lie. It's like I, if anybody watches this and like they got any doubts, because everyone's point kind of passing, and nobody really does it now. So it's like it's steroids and cocaine's the problem with all the young kids fighting, like charged up, built like bricks. She is fighting three o'clock in the morning, more so, isn't it? But. I feel like you've got to tell the truth, like, like and, and I did. I, I, I'm, I'm so lucky. I've got a thing. I've got hepatitis. I've had my um, B vaccinations now. My missus, when she, when I met her, she would heard all the stories, and I'd said to her straight away, "Yep, yeah, it's all true." But, and she didn't do a thing with me until we had all the blood tests mm -hmm. and we had all the through. And she stuck by me. We've been together now twenty three years, three kids, mm -hmm. happy and whatnot. But the people like. And it's like, and you'll get out as well. The, the people that's like telling her that, oh, he's a junkie. And blah, blah, blah. That's the people that give me it for free when I got out. Mm -hmm. But once they got me hooked, they didn't give you a fuck all. Yeah. You had to go and get the money. You know, it's like, it's... Um, well, that's that's, that's yeah. the oldest trick in it. Yeah, lower than rats and these bollocks, mate. Loads of them. But again, it's like, so, yeah, so I started ending up, then I started ending up on the needle. And then yeah. once you've had your first go on the needle, you ain't going back. It's like, it's like what cost me £10, now cost me £2, and I'll get the same high. But unfortunately that soon catches up as well and then before you know it you're injecting 10 pounds of worth and then you're injecting like hundreds of pounds worth and then you're doing like cracking narrowing in the same spoon and, you're, and then it's like in the same needle and you're like, like it's a massive rush and then like shh, on the floor and that's when the OD and stuff sort of fortunately I never OD to the point where the ambulance is coming took me away I had it more like where my mates threw water over me dragged me out and maybe you walk around Garland and try not to let you die because like the next step for them is to just pull you outside and leave you there like you can't bring the smack shack on top by dying in there do you know what I mean they'll drag you out and fucking leave you outside <laughs> so luckily happens, enough it, yeah. yeah kind of yeah it's bad shit like nobody nobody or somebody might stay with you but they're not going to let you OD in their house. Yeah. No, I mean, their mum and dad's out and you're in there all having a fucking 
doing your jollies. Yeah, yeah. yeah look, you've got to be out, mate, regardless of what state it is. And no then, way. Mm. So tell us about your time in podcast then. Yeah, so that was, I was in, God, I didn't, like, it's not like I did armed robbery or anything cool. I uh, I basically, I was in Guy's Marsh, which is in Salisbury, and I barricaded up in the TV room, right, with a handful of my mates. And it was like, we had these chairs and the door opened in and the electric cupboard was in the TV room. So we put our chairs from the wall to the door. And we just looked at that and we all sat on them. We cut our sleeves off, put them over our heads. Like, we look like people that's clan, but it's just so they couldn't see who was who. And uh, right. we stayed in there all night. Can you remember like Top of the Pops 2? We used to be on the telly, <laughs> yeah. like stupid o'clock in the morning. Yeah. We watched Match of the Day, Rocky 1, Top of the Pops 2. And then it started getting a bit hectic. Like there's all these screws outside with cameras. They brought them in from um, Port, uh, Portland Prison. Like they, it's, it's like getting like the Mufti squad, we call them outside, where it gives you a hiding. And, uh, so we all ended up going out and then in the morning they come and took us and they fucking sent us all, all over the country for, for, for fucking about yeah. and I got sent to Parkhurst and then that was like almost like that first trip when I was worried about getting ass raped again. So what's, like, the, what's the difference between a regular prison and Parkhurst? What's... Well Parkhurst is long termers like generally you've only you got to be doing at least 10 years to be in there. Okay. Yeah and then on the wings like they all have budges in their cells. They're like to have a fucking pet they're serving that long. They had budges yeah and like <laughs> so yeah. Shanker, yeah. Yeah. and they had kids kitchens on the end of the land and they could like on a new canting list say in Gloucester or it's in yeah. Bristol or whatever you could buy tobacco and some jam and some tuna and shit there's you could buy like the ingredients for a roast mm. because they could cook and shit they're just they're there forever basically yeah. and then there's me with, like 11 months right on the door and I'm walking because you got like a plaque on all your door like say Orsman whatever your prison number is and your time you're serving and you're walking past giving it the diagonal light our door is like 15 years 18 years 20 years fuck like, fuck's yeah. sake and there's me like doing 11 months skinny little boy and I do think so that, that if they're going to ba- if that shit is going on you're the one they're going to want to bang I suppose I don't know yeah. <laughs> but but they was all more intrigued in how I got sent there doing 11 months yeah. than trying any of that and I've got to be honest I've never heard of any of that shit in the jail really yeah never ever you know like in America it's yeah. like you're it's the like bitch not me it. and all that you could hold my pocket and all that crazy shit <laughs> teabag yeah, teabag yeah. off a of fucking prison yeah, break yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I've never seen none of that shit in in, in in all the times I was out there. Yeah, what was the worst thing you saw? Um, I've seen kind of slashings and I've seen um, art ward. Mm. The worst art ward I've seen was somebody filled up an old bucket with detergent in it and dashed that on a kid and he had like green scabs because of the detergent and shit. But like I said, generally, right, in jail, you're all right if you ain't got something what everybody else wants. Yeah. If you've got drugs, mate, then they're coming. If you haven't, you're kind of all right. You know, it's like you, it's, they won't come unless you've got something. But, yeah. I, luckily, I got. I didn't get bummed. I don't know why. <laughs> I did hear of it, and that's the truth. I really didn't. It's not like a thing. Like we watched Scum and whatnot, but I didn't ever Scum. That 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 film. I watched that when I was about thirteen yeah. with my mate. Right, my dad recommended me to watch it. Right, <laughs> yeah, so I was like thirteen, fourteen, and uh, mate, I was fucking traumatized. Yeah, yeah. Like I was like, I, I went out, and me and my mate ads. We were like, what the fuck have we just watched? Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. That is, yeah, but that savage, was all, that savage, was, fucking. But that, savage. but that, you watch is that, and then you're going put into those places. Yeah, Do you yeah, think that's what's going to happen? Fucking, yeah, mate. If I'm mm. watching that and then and then yeah. going to prison, I can imagine, mate. But I, I, I never really heard of any. Yeah. Of it, to be was fair. Were, were gangs like prevalent in in prisons and stuff? Uh no. It's kind of like you had your. Like, I know it's like you see that on the films like, you, like the black guys tend to hang around with the black guys more or so. But it wasn't like you couldn't talk or you like yeah. you couldn't deal with each other like in the films. It was just. They, everybody kind of yeah. it was, it was, and it's kind of a bit like football you know like Bristol don't like uh, Swindon or whatever or Liverpool or whatever but no no so like Bristol don't like Bristol say for instance like in Bristol we had North West South Mead Art Cliff like in Bristol we don't actually really like each other much but if it kicked off against another town then it was like football oh, absolutely. yeah like so like it could be West Ham and Millwall was like eating each other but then it's England versus Germany they're together aren't they yeah. <laughs> and it was a bit like that you know yeah, okay. but it was it wasn't that like I could have. I think where they got it wrong is they should have sent me really far first sentence where you ain't got all your mates and all that. Like they should send all the people from Bristol to like different places. So like you're gonna get our time because mm. the, the people that come in and didn't know nobody and did get our time. You never seen them again once. Everybody else you've seen who was like a bit of a ladder there was always in there and there's always in every. Like you they're always in the system because they're not. It's no problem for them. I think they need to make it harder. Mm. And they probably hate me saying that, the boys, but it's like you wouldn't have went back if it had been harder. It wasn't that. It was, it was light work, and that's the trouble. It's, mm-hmm. it's, if it would have been like a Borstal back in the yeah. day, I suspect, you probably wouldn't have went back, but it's, 
it's a it's pussification. It yeah. really is. It's like we're and we're just we're just getting worse with it now. The generations are getting softer and softer and softer, and it's mm-hmm. we needed it harder. Yeah. And that's the that's the truth. It was it wasn't no thing. It was just a nightmare because for the first couple of weeks because you had to do a withdrawal, and then yeah. after that it was all right again. You know. Yeah, and then we we talked off air a little bit about and we've mentioned it throughout, I think, but obviously people that go down that path, especially with heroin, often don't make it, make no. it out of the side, but... I've carried seven coffins, I have. Have you really? Seven of my friends' coffins. Yeah. So, mate, you, you mentioned you were, you, you went in a few times and every time you were just waiting to get out so you could get back on the Yeah, heroin. yeah. And then, and then, the, the, that's actually, that's, there's a, so like, basically that shit just repeated itself yeah. loads of times. And it was the same thing. So how did you change that cycle? Yeah, this is the, it is the, this is where my auntie, I got a lover for this. There's a drug called naltraxone, right? And basically it's an opiate blocker. So say, say you're clean now, but the likelihood you're gonna take it. If you take these for seven days, they're in your system for seven days. And then hopefully after 14 days, you'll just sort of dread out, no, I don't wanna do it. And you'll take a tablet again, kind of, yeah. But if you take heroin while you're on the tablet, it kicks it out of you almost like, Almost like a a withdrawal condensed into an hour. Like oh. I've seen somebody, like so my friend's missus wanted to leave her husband, right? Well, her boyfriend, because he was a bit of a, a bastard beater and whatnot. And yeah. he was on methadone and heroin. Mm-hmm. And she gave him two of these now tracks and was telling them they was downers. Like, because we was all taking Valiums, all that shit. We'd have had anything with drug is, right? And he took these two while he was on 100 mil of methadone and heroin. He fucking dropped to the floor, shit himself, puked, nearly died. He had to get an ambulance. And all the time he's on the floor dying, she's packing her gear because it was all set up for her to leave him. <laughs> right? no yeah, she rang an ambulance on the way out, mate, and they saved him. Mm. But after seeing Carl do that, God bless his soul, young himself, yeah, after seeing that, right, it was like the thought of taking heroin while you had that tablet in you, would just, you wouldn't do it. You just mm. wouldn't do it. And I was fortunate enough, when I got out and I was 24, um, there were still some pubs open in my estate and people were still going to drink, like smoking man one out. And like, it was still a social scene in the pubs. Like, in my estate now, there's not one pub. They're all closed down. It's like they ripped the tills out with ballets on with, with the last pub while it was open in the daytime. It's just, it's fucked, yeah. And it's in the, we had a double page spread every fortnight in the news of the world on my estate when that happened and then that was in there and it just looked fucking terrible because some of my friends have got clean after and there have been nothing for them no social life the pubs are all closed nobody's in there drinking everybody's at home with their missus and kids and they've missed that boat mm. so they're lonely and the next thing they're back doing that because there's fuck who else to do mm. but I was lucky there was this big party life was kind of going on and I, and you got to imagine from 14 to 24 most blokes are out shagging fighting fun making money doing these things I missed it all Right, like I was my my sexual experiences were, was just down to a couple of other druggy girls with me, you know, no nothing ever set in stone, nothing ever. So you missed out on a hell of a lot. And then all of a sudden, I'm 24, I'm built quite well because I just done a stretch. You know what I mean? I got a few quid. I'm down the pub. I'm a bit of a boy. I'm enjoying it. But I got to take these now tractings, right? And I'm taking them, taking them. But I couldn't do any of the other drugs what everybody else is doing because if there's any trace of any of that shit in there, you're gonna fall on the floor and shit your pants in front of the old pub. And really? you're not, yeah, you're not taking. Yeah. Yeah. Well, but after I seen or heard yeah, about cock roll, it was just yeah. no way is that happening to me, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know. Yeah. And then I think it was like six or seven months down the line. I said to my auntie, look, they're all going raving and all that. And you were just like people are like, sm- they're smacking the pills, and I thought. I Taking any fucking pills, no way, not on these tablets. Do you know what I mean? And I said to her, I really, f- I, I know it sounds mental, but I want to get off these ones you're giving me because I want to do recreational drugs with my friends. I don't want to do heroin and that, but I want to go out and party with them lot. And then she said, Well, we'll go see Dr. Real and we'll see what she says. And I went and seen Dr. Real and they pl- placeboed me with vitamin B tablets for seven months. <laughs> so I was placeboed into getting off of heroin. Wow. And then by then, I had a life. Mm. And that was what it was. All the other times that I'd stopped, I'd never actually experienced a fun life, which would make you not want to do it again. Yeah. It was just it's just at the jail waiting for the day to get out to get some more, because that was my life. Yeah. And then when I experienced a bit of life, and then like out of girls, clubbing, having a fight, you know, just like what normal lads in their twenties were up to at the time. And that was what I needed. Mm. And then as of that day, I've never, ever relapsed. And I've been clean now. Well, I'm 46 next month, and I and I was 24 when I stopped. Mm. Now, don't get me wrong; I've done other drugs. I'm not a saint, but I've never touched heroin. I've never touched crack. Like 
if you, if you go back to that, you must be some sort of muppet. Isn't you? you know, I've learned yeah. the yeah. really hard way. I think a lot for a lot of people, it's it's like you say when they they just come out and go straight back into the same circles. Yeah. Of people. Yeah. yeah, and that's yeah. The, that's it. It's the social side of it because it? they're all your mates, aren't they? Yeah, all your mates and well, people. associates. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Mates, yeah. they yeah. were your friends at one point. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but then so this was when I was twenty four and I got out. My auntie's mm. placebo me, and then my mum died within twelve months. Like she had bronchitis pneumonia she's only 52 and she was lovely like she really and I felt like I ruined everything from when I was 14 to you know that like she lost her boy at 14 basically and uh, that was the, the the biggest the biggest regret she was yeah. my mom was lovely she really really was she never had a bad bone in her body and I put her through some fucking shit you know mm -hmm. but fortunately I took her out like the week before like, that year we was like proper but um, she never got to meet my kids mm -hmm. You know, and um, we was like drinking the week before she died and we had, I took her out for a Sunday dinner and all that. Like, so like, we got a good, that last 12 months was great, but it, that was, that's like the biggest thing. The time I lost yeah. my mum worrying and crying to me. And what was your relationship like with your dad? My yeah. real, my yeah, real, real dad, my real dad, yeah. he never bought, ever come back, mate. When we was kids, he went for the milk. He went to get the milk Did when we was kids, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what, what age were you then? Um, I don't know. I think I must have been three. Right. I, okay. I can't, so you don't I, I can't really remember. Right. And I've seen yeah. pictures and that. But like I said, I had a step that man. Yeah. He stepped up. And I've got to be honest, he's the best bloke I've ever met. I couldn't have put up with a prick like me. I'd have killed me if I was <laughs> in. Do you know what I mean? I robbed yeah, him. Yeah. I was like, mate, and he'd, get, he'd kick me out for robbing him and he'd give me the car key to sleep in the driveway and bring me out a cup of coffee in the morning. <laughs> Even though I've yeah. robbed this car, I've done all this shit. Do you know what I mean? And um, he was... He'd, well, after my mum died, it was hard on him. It really was. Um, but so by then, I'm doing all right. I got me missus. We're in a flat. I'm, um, I'm earning money and whatnot. Me and my dad goes half on a house. We put down the deposit and we're renting it out and everything's great. Then my girlfriend, um, she was fostered in Penzance when she was young. Long story, like, she probably yeah. won't be saying it on here. But, yeah. but um, we ended up going to Penzance. And then I'm in Penzance and uh, we get to... Was I in Penzance? Yeah, so I always struggled with this timeline, but it's, it was either one of these two. Right, I was in Penzance and I had to come back because my yeah yeah and I was I'm sure we got the phone call. Out. My dad got killed, right? So we have come back from Penzance. Biological dad, no, no, my stepdad. Yeah, okay. and but saying that my biological dad got killed as well. Like, what's your chances? So we makes a joke like in our family, you only got to worry about getting murdered. So as long as you've got your back to the wall, you're all right. <laughs> <laughs> but no, no, all joking aside, but yeah, so. What it was, after my mum and uh, passed away, he was lonely and he was like, there weren't much friends to do, but I go out to the pub and stuff like that. So he ended up drinking quite a bit. And you can imagine being like a middle-aged bloke who's on his own. If there's a bird in the pub single, like you're pretty much on it, aren't you? Right? And she was, she was a horrible fucking thing. She was. She had her slap back hair, her tits like this, fat as fuck. And um, he ended up falling for her anyway, right? And then, uh, then I... Before we went to she shattered his cheekbone with a bottle as they're driving on the road. Like they're having an argument when they're driving. She's drinking alcohol in the car. That's the life they're living. Like they ran around. She smashed him in the face with the bottle and broke his cheekbone. So I heard about this. My bro and this is my my stepdad must have told my brother. What we do don't tell Jane. My brother's completely different to me. I'd have stuck the nut right on her. And I, was, I don't say you should hit women, but she's doing that to him. I'd have nutted her. And so Eve told me, my brother's had a row with my dad. He went, Don't worry, I'm going to tell Jamie anyway what she did. And I went, what are you on about? And you know, she shattered his cheekbone last week. I said, what are you on about? So then I drove over there, but he span off and he rang me up and said, oh, we're not, there's nothing to do with you. You can't get involved. It's not your mom. It's my relationship now. I said, well, you're a fucking idiot then, isn't you? And we started falling, having rows over this bird. Yeah. And then uh, it goes to Penzance with my missus because her grandparents, what well, she called them grandparents, what fostered her was real. So we went down to look after them. And then we got a phone call that she stabbed in the death. You know? Joking. Yeah. Fucking but it was hell, man. Yeah. And I got back and it was fucked up because, like I said, we bought a house with my dad. Mm -hmm. And at the time, he had my mum's house, right? But what he'd done was, like, because he was fucked, and I, and I don't care that I lost out on loads, he'd give me more than I could ever wish for. But the house what I bought with him, and we were renting out to my, our three mates. He'd moved them three out into his house over Witchard. He'd moved into our house, stopped paying the fucking mortgage, stopped paying the house insurance. And he was supposed to be collecting the rent off the three guys because I'm in Penzance and be doing it all. But he'd gone on the alcohol crazy. Uh, he sold our mother's house after that, kicked they out, sold our mother's house, bought a caravan in Q Stoke, which is the, by Western Supermare. I don't know if you boys are familiar with that. <laughs> yeah, and then and that's where they had the fallout, and that's where she killed him in the caravan. And so I've got. Just stopping the death. Yeah, drunken drunken rage like if you you can google it and you see it's all over that because not long a few years after she got out um she got um 
what did she get done for? She got done for the killing, but I think it's like not mentally there. Right. And then, and then, like six years later, she got out, and she's fucking gets arrested, ramming a knife through a door on her next bloke she's with, going, "I killed my." Last. She wanted his husband, but she said, "I killed my last husband. I'll fucking kill you." And she got nicked that time, because like, if that was brought all up about old man again all over the Bristol Evening Post, but it's like they 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 let her out. It's fucking ridiculous. But yeah, so what comes back. He've moved our lodgers out, sold the house, uh, yeah, no, sold our mum's house, bought the caravan, like a nice big static caravan. Yeah. Um, our house was getting repossessed, what I bought with him. There was like letters on the floor and all that. <laughs> our house was getting repossessed. I ended up having to pay 19,000 pounds back because they, they basically sold our house for 19 grand less than what we bought it for, even though it was worth way more than that. Yeah. The caravan, was fucked. There was stab wounds, a stab holes through all the doors. My dad had stab. My dad had. It must have been terrifying, man. I've, I've, sometimes I think about this. I try my best not to, but he had defense wounds all over his hands. So he must have been trying to stop her. And that, to me, that gets me, man. It really do because he was a fucking good bloke. And I'd like to be a stepdad to take on some kids that's not yours and they're complete and utter bastards and to treat me the way he did. Mm. He's a fucking legend. He really, really is. And he died in a terrible, terrible way. And it's horrible, it really is. But, and yeah, so then, so then I lost the house I bought with my dad. The house, what was my inheritance, was my mother's, was sold for the caravan. The caravan was like unsellable, really, because it was a fucking murder scene. Mm -hmm. And then I wasn't his next of kin because he didn't adopt me, and my uncle was, and that cunt done us on the money anyway. <laughs> so, yeah, and then I was at a point now, do I go and fill him in and fucking get myself nicked and all that, yeah. or do I just put a line under this and fucking move on? Because it was, it was like a few years after, like I said, she got off on some technicality, but she'd done a bit of time in a mental place, I think. Mm -hmm. And then um, we got like this car boot sale in Bristol, quite big. And then someone's around me and said, she's in for the car boot selling stuff, mate. And I'm like, do I get her or not? Like, she killed me dad. Do you know what I mean? Like, if there's ever a reason for revenge, this is it. And I said, like, so we had a KX, we had a, <laughs> we had a KX for a <laughs> scrambler. And I said, well, we had um, like a little Tenerife baseball bat. And the plan, our plan, was to drive past and I was going to hit her head off on the back of a scrambler and fucking try and get away with it. And fortunately enough, on my mad esc escapade, she, she wasn't there when I got there. So but you actually was, went to do it? Yeah. Wow, yeah, okay. I was going to air in the head with a baseball bat going about 50 mile an hour on a KX. And I thought it was the least I could do for that blue. And, and it was terrible, but that's where my head was at at the time. But but she was gone, and then like I said, years later, she's fucking nicked again. Yeah. I was, like I said, if on my phone, like the guy that sponsored me for jujitsu, right? He gave me five hundred quid every week to do these comps and that. Really nice, my yeah. friend. Was, and then the message before the message about him asking to sponsor me was the one he sent me of her back in jail again, done somebody else in, and I was like, because I seen her face and I went for the messages. They were done. But yeah, so like that's what I think. All this shit I've been through and everything that's come out of it, I think I've come out of the other side unscathed, right? I'm probably not perfect, like, physically from it all, but I got my, I got all the conversations, I got myself, and I got empathy, mate. I've been to the bottom, I've lived in squats, man. I've fucking, with nowhere to go, potless, everyone had it fucked. And I've been in, but, like, where we've had a rob with 20 grand. And when you're a junkie, that's like, you're a millionaire, mate, and we're smoking crap golf balls and we're rich and it's like we're on top of the world that, in that at that time you know yeah. you've had the eyes and the lows and I've come out the other end of it now and I think I'm a better person and even though it's been one massive fuckery I wouldn't change it mm -hmm. I don't think I think like I said you know, everything leads to this mm -hmm. I think now I can I've got a better outlook on the world than most of my mates that I've never fucked up like yeah. they're all like, like i got friends I know, I know, I know it sounds horrible they, they, they look at owners man like, oh, fucking Get a job you can't, or whatever. And I mm -hmm. think you don't know, man, what that fuck, what's happened to him. You don't. And I got, I, I, it made me a much nicer person, I believe, now, a better version. And I think the jujitsu and all that, man, has obviously guided me on the right path yeah. for the last 15 years. Because this was the other thing, like, I don't, most people don't know this, I fucked up majorly during the COVID break. I was, my missus was in Plymouth because her dad was, it was COVID, her dad was high risk and she was looking for us to buy our house down there. We was going to go to Plymouth first and she was in Salt Ash. I started getting these like seven and a half grand fucking government uh, things every three months. For being self-employed? Yeah, right, <laughs> right. So I'm getting all this money I'm there on my own and I'm not the sort of person, my, I can't be doing it. Mm -hmm. So the last drugs I was taking was Coke, out sniffing Coke. So the next thing I'm like getting a bit of Coke. Then I can't sleep, so I'm buying Valium. 
So I'm doing nine Valiums to get me out down. Waking up in the morning, like, moaned, because I took a load of sleeping tablets, but I got coke, because I bought angst. And then so I'll have a line again. And then I'll fucking... I'm chasing my tail all day, driving around on a KTM 450, fucking off me nut for like best part of two years during COVID. And then I come down here, mate, right? And it's because the schools were shut. If all the jujitsu schools were open, I'd have been perfect. But I had nothing to do with my time. Mm. And I come down here now, like once I do jujitsu again, but I've just been on the bag for two years. I'm skinny. I am trained. I'm fucked. Yeah, right? My missus doesn't even know. Like she knows now. Mm. <laughs> Let's do that. <laughs> no, but, 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 you know, but... And so I've had to, like, and then I've, where do I go for jujitsu? I don't know nobody. Yeah. Rob Homan, I've fought against him loads of times in the finals at the comps. Let's go to his gym. Yeah, it's that so, hybrid, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but I was driving down the road on my bike and I seen the kitty with a tatami top on. And it's like, fucking hell. So I skidded around and it was Jamie. <laughs> he was yeah, shit himself. You know, it was, yeah, it's Jamie Carr. And it's like, he's like good friends with Rob. And, the, and I seen him at the comps and all that. And they said, they invited me down. I went to jujitsu, mate. I got battered by everybody. And you're a black belt, mate. And you're going in there. And you're fucking getting done by everybody. I puked up three times out the door. <laughs> where I was just so fucked. But it was like, in my head, I was telling myself, I don't get back on now. I'm going to be that guy that don't never go back because I don't want to lose. and I don't want to. So I just, I'm literally just getting back to where I was, I reckon, mm-hmm. after that two year stint of just doing that shit every day. And I nearly fucked everything up again. I was so close to fucking everything up again due just, to that just shit from that, yeah. yeah because just and that, that's me having no outlet because of covid mm. and this i don't know what it is i got about this obsessive compulsive i gotta be doing so why can't i just sit there and watch telly like everybody else yeah like you said though mate i think that those those drugs from that those formative yeah, years yeah i think it must have had some why so, you, mate? it's got to, it's your brain still developing until you're like fucking 24 yeah mate. so I if think you're I, on the fucking gear during that period then it must have done some up yeah, yeah. and I, I but yeah i was really close to fucking it all again yeah. in my 40s <laughs> it's like <laughs> well, i'm up it on a different class a drug completely and now I used to laugh at people, what was crackheads, and say, oh, I'm withdrawing. It's not physical, it's mental. Like with the heroin, you shit yourself, you puke, you die, you're, oh, you touch you like that, and you're like, oh. And the, the, the cokeheads and the crackheads, they don't get that, but they, sort of, they can't stop thinking, it can't stop thinking. Can't. And that was the first time I had a withdrawal, what well, weren't physical, but mental. Mm. And boy, is it mental. At one point, I can remember being in my bathroom, right? I got all this oil bath going, trying to clear my nose. Right, and I've got the coke lined up and not inside the bathroom because the steam makes it, so it goes all weird. So, so I'm waiting to unblock my nose so I could get one more out there. I'm like, <clears throat> can't get out there. I've got sinuses infections that's going all around the back of my head because I'm just shoveling Charlie up my nose all day. I started bombing it because I couldn't sniff it anymore. I'm putting in Rizzlers and chucking it down my neck because I won't I won't feel it half hours time. Yeah, it's so dangerous as well. Yeah. Like coke and then Valium. Yeah. Because one's an upper and one's a yeah. downer. That, I, had a, I had a friend recently who, who passed away from that. Yeah, the, the, the people don't on our state So many, it. mate, so many people, because they, they're out on it all night. You're right, they're they're doing out on it all night drinking, coke, go home, they take three, four Valiums, heart just fucking yeah. boom, they don't wake I'm up. I'm so lucky, mate, so I really am, because I was, doing, I was doing nine blues at one stage per night, and I knew I was doing nine, because when I... That finally, says Valium, not Viagra, right? Yeah, Valium, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 But um, I knew it was nine, because I when I did this, like, realised that we bought the house now, and salt house, and I've got to fucking get back to normal before I come here, and I started doing nine a night, to eight a night, to seven a night, to six a night, and then when I got down to four, I'd have to do, like, four for today, four tomorrow, three tomorrow, three tomorrow, and I'd wing myself down, mm. and I stopped it all, and even now, like literally yesterday, I had a text message that said, uh, back on, nine out of 10. Some Coke dealer in Bristol selling me, you got some rocket fuel. And I was like, fuck. You change your number. Mate. It. Yeah, but I've had the same number for donkey's years. Now everybody knows it. Like, but I was like, and I thought, thank fuck. I'm, I've been here now, and I haven't had a sniff since the day I arrived. And we've been here over two years. And it's just the circles you're in. And I, I'm, I can't blame anybody else for my weakness to all this shit. And I'm not even going to try. It's all down to me. I had good family, I chose this shit. Even like after all that, I nearly blew it all away again. After getting clean and being good, I did with the jujitsu and all the good stuff in my life, I still nearly fucked it on coat. Mm. And as not many people know how bad I was. Because nobody gives a fuck. Nobody was like coming around. Nobody cared. And, and the thing was, I'd not even open the door. I'd see people like, oh fuck, you know. Mm. I'm not, Cause you can't start becoming recluse. And then I had a bit of cash and arm work. And I was like sniffing in the fucking house and walk around. And when a bloke's coming in, I'm like, I just don't want to make eye contact with him and all that. And it's like, and, and, uh, what the fuck was I doing? Mm. 
And I'm just come out the back end of it again, and I just knew I can't fuck up again. I'm, I'm not immortal. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. 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 yeah, so I'm good now. But again, I'm, though, mate, if, you're, if you've come down here and you've surrounded yourself with good people that don't do that. That's exactly that. We talk about it a lot. And if you surround yourself with people that are like-minded, good people, it, it, it's fucking hard for you then to go back to yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. You know, and if you do end up going back to it, you're kind of fucked at that point. Well, yeah. But as, yeah. As in with good people. Yeah, if, yeah, if you, know, you can because, mess that up. Because good yeah. people don't tend to accept it. As no, much. they that won't. Sense if it, you know, because they're like, well, you've had this many chances. Well, yeah. I, and I went back to Bristol last night on the way back from London. I went to stop. I got a new niece born. So I, went, I thought I got a pop in at least. And then as I was leaving his house, it was like literally my old street I grew up on, past the road. Three of my mates come past. This is like, I must have left his house 11 if I got him at one, about two hours. And they was walking down the road, like one on a mountain bike, one chatting. And they're all four. Six and we're at school with them. Well, they're right. rocking around on notebooks. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, well, yeah. Right. I'm walking out. down the road and they've just scored some shit because they was all happy. And I was like, yeah. And he's oh, and they're giving me colours and I just thought, fucking state, man. Mm. And they're like, and that's their life still. And I just thought, thank fuck. Yeah, well done, mate. Yeah, and and that's and that's that's the after all this like, and it's not like I said, it's all my own fault. But now what I've brought out of it always. Like I said, I've got empathy for everyone else. And whenever, like, I haven't done it since I've been down here, but I will, I've got to get on it. I was doing like the choices and consequences talks with the kids. Mm. I was giving them free jujitsu classes on my estate to try and keep them off the street. It's like I had one, <laughs> I had a kid's class, and like, one of the kids went, Don't a kid that's bullying me. And like in the same class, I'm like, fuck, right? So I can't have the bully who's bullying all these kids in the class. So I've gone out to him and I said, like, Mate, if you come back next week and he all says you ain't been bullying him in school and you're being all right, you come back. But I can't have you in here if you're the one starting them or you're the reason why I got them here. Mm. Right? Yeah. You know what I mean? yeah. So he chucks him out, like says, like, not army, but you come back next. So he didn't pay anyway, there's all for free. And then um, when we goes out at the end of the class, you've set the fucking park on fire in the middle of the field and he's from bricks at the fire brigade. And you're like, should have I kept them in the class? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah. But but you can only help so much. If the parents are driving past and don't care he's out there doing it, you can only help so much. But yeah, I've done lots of good stuff since mm -hmm. trying to stop the kids get on the drugs. And my my school, what I had in Bristol, is now still going round by my friends, still on our council estate on the main Broadway of the shops, and he helps all the kids the same. Big shout, Nick Jordan. He, he's doing the aftermath jujitsu. Yeah. He's looking after all the kids in all. Mate, pe people like you, I think that have got that insight to sort of working in those sort of deprived communities, mate. Is it's yeah. so fucking needed and so powerful. Yeah. So yeah, keep up that good work, mate. Cheers. As I, I don't know how this works with your podcast and whatnot. Like, like, mate, you want to shout anything out? No, no. It, I just, I just, I'm easy. But I just, it's like, it's, I'm not. It's not a bragging story, and mm. it's not. Like, it's, it's just, I'm lucky to be alive. And it's, if anybody, anybody's even thinking or they're just starting to do shit that they shouldn't be doing, whether it's sniffing or whatever, it's dangerous game. You don't want to be up to it. And I'm lucky. I'm one of the lucky ones. Like, so I've carried. I think seven of my friends. I mean, this boy here, that's my, that's my cousin, EOD, when? 2015? Mm. Yeah, 2015, 33, 34, I think it was. Yeah. In fact, on my memories, it was today. Was it really? September, I'm sure it's today, or, or it's, yeah. it's, I'd probably put up for a couple of days yeah. because I was upset, but yeah, it had been that many years today. Yeah, so what would you say to like, you probably won't get many kids watching this sadly, no. but what would you say to like young adults that are maybe involved in that life or kind of a lot yeah, the it. trouble is you can say what you want to <laughs> yeah. say, I, I, I used to say, I could I could sell sand to an Arab and I could sell snow to an Eskimo when I was on that yeah. shit I could blag my mum every time and she knew and, but uh, is until you're ready and I wouldn't I didn't choose to stop I just had to in, like someone's got to take you and let you see what life is out there rather than that because at the time when, when you're getting all those hits off the dopamine and feeling great off all the drugs you think it's a good life mm -hmm. but once I actually like I said had a couple of months of going out the pub and that's not the good life man. they could be doing much better so I was at the pub playing pool but I'd never done none of that shit and, I'd, and, and when they told me it was a placebo it was like thank God well, it's just because all it was was the experience of a decent bit of life, mm. having fun, going out with your mates, doing all the stuff that I didn't do is what made the difference. So change what you're doing, really. And like you said, there's the people I'm surrounding myself around now is making a massive difference. Because like I said, I'm an open book. I don't hide none of this shit. I can't, I can't remember lies. I'm better off just being open and you take me for as I am and like me or you don't and it's your problem because I'm not going to worry about it. You know what I mean? It's, yeah, that's fair enough. Yeah, it's a good way to be, mate. Yeah, because you can't change nothing. That's, it's fact. 
that I fucked up massively, right? And I could sugarcoat it all and pretend that I didn't do the nasty. I didn't have to come in and tell you that I burgled people's houses when they're in bed. I could have sugarcoated it and said, oh, no, but why was all the other boys or whatever. Like, yeah. No, the fact of the matter, I did that stuff and I got to live with the shit I did. And at any point in time, somebody could say, your dad's a smackhead to my boys and stuff like that, you know? In that, I've lived two lives, mate. I've been a, I've gone for a 10-year class A bender, come out in the backside of it, still with my teeth and all the conversation. Then I've started jujitsu. Like, how many people makes it to a jujitsu black belt? I've trained hard for 15 moves. fucking years, mate. Competing all over the shop, grafting, self-employed. And I've, we've, we're not rich or nothing, but I've caught up with everybody else. I've got three beautiful kids. I've got my own nice one mortgage, like everyone else in debt yeah. to the man, you know? <laughs> uh, but, but I've gone full circle and I've managed, I feel like I've lived two lives. Mm. And now I've seen the dark side and now I've seen the light side and I know which one I want to be on. Yeah. But none of my kids will ever be on drugs because I know what I'm looking for. Yeah. And, do you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and, and that's the, and if you can pass that down, because you will get fuck ups in every generation. There's going to be, and it's, that's, that's the key to it. It's just trying to make sure that you don't continue it. Yeah. I, but that must be, my mum liked the drink and a fag, hence dying at 52. <laughs> Right, right, right. Um, she had addictive personality, right? And I just now we know is this a thing in our family. The likely of my three children have got some form of this as well. So we just want to make sure that they're doing healthy addiction and things like jujitsu, yeah. stuff where you can enjoy yourself, get your feel great from like you do from the gym, ach- learn something, make new friends, all positive, positive addiction, and that's what it's about. Now I've done all the negative addictions; they're fun for a minute. <laughs> it's not sustainable <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. mate do you want to uh, give any your sponsor shout out or close yeah, out with um, any comments well I don't know if you're listening, if you're listening to this, but I got a few to be fair I, that's the other thing our little council estate is full of shit bags and rough necks and whatnot, but there are a handful of people that have made it and they've done pretty well like Maintain the Dream my friend Lee Bray owns a firm called Maintain the Dream he sponsors the local football teams he sponsors us he sponsors everybody my other mate at um Southwest in, in oh, I'm gonna mess it up, Mark. Southwest Inter Solutions. I think they already do like acoustic sound and shit like that. He's up to us. He was paying a month's he was paying a month's fees for kids that he don't even know and sponsoring us for competitions, you know? My friend I like Martin Lee messaged me the other week, just he see me on the podium, I won the reorg open and he uh but James, if you ever need a sponsor, man, give me a shout. And I'm like, oh that'd be lovely, mate. I had five hundred quid transferred later on that day. And that's um, smart access scaffolding my only server they're, they're all been really really good I can't knock them at all like, all the guys like on the council state I believe it's a little bit of a tax write off as well man so if you have people looking <laughs> yeah, for sponsors yeah. and they've got mates who've got firms if you're just about to get it for 40% tax sponsor a few things in your community and get it brought down and claim the tax back you're helping the people and you're saving the, saving the tax you know? <laughs> yeah. so, you know what I mean <laughs> it help everybody yeah. but yeah thank you for having me on as well like I said it's a bit of a crazy story and whatnot. Mm. Like, like the, the big takes from it is like, I missed all that time with my mum. Then my dad got done in. And it's like, and he was a fucking, they were saints with the shit I had to do with me, you know? That's the big, like, the time that I lost and all that sort of stuff, I was still fucking doing me thing, like thinking I was the lad at the nick and whatnot. Yeah. It was the the, the, the the loss of time with your family. That's what you don't never get back. And the only one who's fucking about drugs now the one thing that's certain is people's going to croak it. So when you're off on a 10-year stint doing your thing, they're getting old and dying, and you're, just, you're so involved in yourself, you, just, you don't fucking take no notice. And that's the biggest regret I've got is mm. my ma, really. She was a fucking angel when I blew it. Yeah. Thanks, yeah, mate. Thanks so much for coming on, mate. Yeah, you're welcome. Absolutely fucking amazing. Cheers, mate. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah.